Well, here we are again. I'm Brother James. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We're going to get bogged down a little bit here for the next uh, two or three lessons, talking about these two tribulation witnesses. The Bible says in Revelation 11, verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must be in this, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Let, let me say before we begin to break this passage down, I believe everything I just read will happen just as it is written. It's not symbol, it's not figure, it's the word of God. That's what I believe. If you don't believe that, I, that's, maybe I can persuade you, maybe I can't. But that's, that's what I believe. These witnesses are said to be olive trees, having oil, which is off to figure for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They are also lamps, sending forth light of the Spirit amidst the darkness enveloping the Jew and the Gentile at this time. Their number is significant. During the church age, while the Holy Spirit is dwelling within believers, there was a full heavenly witness, seven candlesticks sending out their light. The sevenfold light is now transferred, as it were, to heaven, where the seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, Revelation 4, 5. But God will not be without a testimony on earth, therefore, two witnesses, the smallest number for adequate evidence according to the law, are raised up. Remember Numbers 3530, the mouth of two witnesses? Deuteronomy 1915, two witnesses. Matthew 1816, two witnesses, the minimum number required to confirm something is true. So God's down to his minimal witness but he still has a witness. They're clothed in sackcloth. These garments give us an indication of the nature of their testimony. Sackcloth is a familiar expression of mourning and humiliation before God. Joel 1.13, 1 Kings 20, verse 31, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 8, sackcloth. When you're when you are trying to get as low as you can so that God will maybe, just maybe, have pity upon you, you put on sackcloth. It was worn by prophets who felt the weight of their ministry. See Daniel 9, 3. Or penitents feeling the weight of their need. Isaiah 37, verses 1 and 2. 
Believers in, in this day are told to rejoice in the Lord, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoicing suits those who have finished redemption. Sackcloth suits those who feel and acknowledge their sin and are crying to God for salvation. The garments of mourning will be as appropriate to the suffering Jewish remnant as the garments of praise are to the New Testament church. Then notice this phrase. These are the two olive trees standing, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. The only other use of this term is way back in Genesis 24 and verse number 3, where it's the oath given Abraham's servant. Genesis 24 and verse 3. Let me get all the way back here and pull it out. Genesis 24 and verse number 3. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou should not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Only twice do we find this phrase. We also are reminded of Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. And we're going to read a lengthy portion of that passage because it helps us with our context. Zechariah 4, and let's start at verse 11. Zechariah 4, starting at verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Certainly seems to me to be a match. More on that later. They've given power uh, if any man hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. I must say again, this is not the church in the Great Tribulation, and it's easily proven time and time again. Jesus Christ has witnesses while he is walking this earth assembling that body into which he will breathe life that will become his church. And I want you to consider the instruction he gives them. In Luke 9, 51, it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans for to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. They went and said to the Samaritans, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And the Samaritans said, we don't want him here. Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did they got scripture for it. The Old Testament prophet burned them up. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Do you know what Jesus Christ was not interested in doing? Burning men up. Do you know what the disciples wanted to do? They wanted to burn with fire the opponents of the Lord. And Jesus said, you got, you, you, you're misunderstanding. That's, that's not what we're doing. But we used to do it that way. And Jesus said, yes, we used to do it that way. But that's not what we're doing now. Well, when I come to Revelation chapter 11, if, if we're back to doing it that way, then the now is over. Old Testament 
Elisha burned them up. New Testament, can we burn them up? No, that's not what we're doing. We're here to save them. Well, if in Revelation chapter 11 we're burning them up, then that day, that time, that age in which saving souls took precedence over cleansing the population, that church age must have ended and we must have returned to God's dealings with nations through the nation of Israel. Pretty clear, pretty clear. Also, notice they are given uh, this uh, power, this fire, and allowed to smite, to smite. Uh, this attitude uh, is plainly not that of Christians. We have obviously returned to an operation of God whereby justice is in the forefront and grace is in the shadows. God's always dealt with men in grace, but sometimes it's grace and justice. Other times it's justice and grace, and we certainly back, are back to the times when justice prevails. That it rain not. So they fire out of the mouths to burn up enemies, but then they can stop the rain, turn waters to blood, smite the earth with plagues, the Bible says, as often as they will. Now about this rain, God promised in the law that drought would be one of the consequences of disobedience. And this was especially true when the sin was idol worship or sacrilege regarding the temple. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you Bible verses where God promised his people in his law, if there was sacrilege in the temple, the Antichrist, or idolatry, the beast, the image of the beast, that God would stop the rain and take away the water. Now, before I run the references, Think back, think back a chapter or two. Remember a third of the sea been turned to blood? A third of the fresh water has been poisoned? The only relief for that would be refreshing rain coming down. And God for three and one half years is going to stop the rain. There'll be none. You can't even hope to catch water out of the sky because your well has gone bad or catch water out of the sky because your river is polluted and poisoned. There's no rain falling. Because of the corruption going on in that temple and the idolatry going on in your homes and in your streets because you've rejected the word of God in these matters, he's going to stop the rain. Let me show you. Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 23, Deuteronomy 28, and for, for context, verse number 15, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Verse 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron, and the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. That's serious. Terrible, terrible threatening, but it's going to come to pass because they wouldn't heed the word of the Lord. Leviticus 26 and verse number 1, Leviticus 26 verse 1, Ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image, nor rear, up, uh, rear you up a standing image, 
neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 19. What if they disobey that commandment? I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. No idols, no images, no idolatry, or, or, I will turn off the rain. Pretty serious. <laughs> very, very, very serious. Back to Zechariah chapter 10. Chapter 10 this time, Zechariah 10, and verse number 1. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain, therefore they went their way as a flock and were troubled because there was no shepherd. Idols, no rain. Get rid of the idols, I'll send the rain. Pretty simple. Jeremiah 14, the great prophet Jeremiah, chapter 14, verse 22. Jeremiah 14, 22. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. God. Here's, here's, here's what God says. You want to go make a statue of a bird and pray to it? Well, ask it for rain. See if it can make it rain. You want to make your little monkey God and put him up on a pole and, and offer sacrifices at his feet? See if he can end your drought. When you're tired of these idols who can't give you rain water, if you'll turn back to me, I will give you rain because I'm the only one that can do it. See, people want, people want God's blessings. They just don't want God. They want the good things that they can get from God. They just don't want the God who gives the good things. And he's put up with that for a long time. In that great tribulation, he's not going to put up with it any longer. One more reference in this regard. Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. Joel, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Haggai. There we go. Haggai chapter 1, verse number 9. He looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. See that? You didn't trust me. You didn't look to me. You didn't call on me. You didn't acknowledge me. You didn't worship me. So... No rain. I'll just turn off the rain. That's all God has to do. And in the time of great tribulation, he will do just that. We sure appreciate you watching these Bible studies. We also record our church services every week and post them to this channel. We have uh, recorded sermons from my, my speaking appearances in, in other places, those are also there and available. But on our website, we have available dozens of books, commentaries on different books of the Bible, uh, topical studies. We have uh, evangelistic literature. We have uh, testimony, just pr pretty much, pretty much anything you could need to help you learn the Word of God and study the Word of God and witness for God, from the Word of God. And if you visit that website, you'll find all those materials. It's jameswnox.org. Thank you for subscribing. Hope you'll join us next time. We'll pick up right here. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you and good day.